Hello and welcome to the second webinar. I'm really excited to have you guys here. So give me a chat, let me know some questions. I'll answer them as I can. Um, got Leo here in the background, my sweet dog. He might bark, I hope he doesn't. <laughs> anyway, so today, just a recap, uh, we went over the joint space last time and um, I talked to you about the importance of synovial fluid and what's um, considered mobility. And mobility is um, the range of motion through the joint. So we talked about that. But today we're going to talk about muscles and fascia, which are so important. Um, I'm jumping right in because I'm going to do this in 15 minutes and let's just go for this right now. So movement is important for health. I've talked about that, but um, what the key benefits are of movement are increased flexibility, increased range of motion, which allows us to have increased strength, more muscle activation, uh, decreased risk of injury, reduced soreness in joints and muscles, more fluid movements. Flexibility, which is in the muscles, is the ability of the muscle to um, lengthen and shorten, okay? When the muscle doesn't have the full flexibility to lengthen or shorten, it's weaker and it's tighter, okay? When we have more flexibility in our muscles, we have fewer injuries, less pain, improved posture and balance, increased strength um, and it enhances our physical performance. So we really want that. And I know you're all sitting here thinking, oh, I don't wanna exercise so I just don't wanna do it. But exercise, everybody thinks that exercise is, oh, I gotta go to the gym and I have to do 300 sit-ups and 15,000 push-ups and whatever it is. That's really not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about getting out and move and there's fun ways to move that give you exercise. So we're gonna go through a little bit of that. Um, the guidelines from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services recommend that the adult um, have this much exercise or this much movement in their day. Um, number one, adults or people and children should sit less than they stand. And so for example, you shouldn't be sitting longer than three hours a day. Now think about that. We need to be up. I have stand-up desks. Um, you know, as a physical therapist, I never really got to sit all those years I've, I've been treating. Uh, I was pushing a cart around with my computer on it. And I encourage everybody that has a hobby that's sitting to figure out a standing desk. Um, even if you're a sewer, um, Potter Your Barn has a really, really cool stand-up desk and it's gorgeous and it's big and you can put your sewing machine on it and you can raise that thing up and you can sew standing. Sitting causes so much tightness in the muscles of the um, hip flexors, which pulls on the spine, which causes your posture to go out of alignment. But really more importantly, sitting causes us to have tightness in our diaphragm which because the psoas muscle attaches to the diaphragm and we cannot breathe as well. So it contributes to a whole bunch of types of diseases. Okay, enough about my setting. So anyway, <laughs> um, you need about, if you're just doing gentle working out or walking or movement, you need about two hours and 30 minutes up to five hours a week. So 30 minute walk a day, okay? Um, that would be beneficial to you. Um, if you want to do it a little harder, cardiovascular fitness, where you'd have a, an increase in the vigorousness of the exercise, then you don't have to do it as long. So one hour to, in 15 minutes to two hours um, per week. Now I'm going to get further into movement with you. And I'm going to talk about mitochondria and I'm going to talk about telomeres in our last webinar. And there's a lot of studies out there that say um, what's called HIT or it's called nitric acid dump exercises um, are key to our longevity and getting the blood flowing. So we're going to talk about that 
the last webinar, not today. So these guidelines from the US Department of Health and Human Services, they're good, but just know that you need to get up and start moving. And we're gonna go through how to move and different ways to move. And I'll explain all that to you. I just know I only have 15 minutes, so I'm going through this fast. <laughs> Um, there are three primary types of physical activity and all three are necessary for good health. Okay, so one is aerobics. Now I know everybody thinks, oh my God, aerobic dance, or I've got to go do step aerobics, or I got to go get on the bicycle, or I got to do whatever. Aerobics is, you could be dancing. You could be, you know, uh, climbing 10 flights of stairs at one time. You could be um, uh, biking. You could do fast paced walking. Um, this should, this type of activity should be done daily. We want to get our heart rate up, get the blood flowing. And you're going to understand further why it's important in our last video, why it's important to get the blood flowing through our body. It's for mitochondrial health. It's for digestion of our food and it's for, um, help in keeping us, our cell health good and strong. And it also helps with longevity. Okay. Um, Muscle strengthening is another form of movement that we need to do. Um, the total muscle fibers um, significantly shrink or reduce beginning at the age of 25. So, um, you know, I'm uh, about 60 right now and everybody may look at me as, oh my gosh, you know, um, I don't need to worry about this because you're talking about losing muscle growth and losing muscle mass at 60. Well, I'm, I'm here to tell you it starts at age 25. So moms, grandmas, aunts, we need to keep everybody that's age 25 moving. It doesn't just happen with um, being more mature. It happens at age 25. And so let's say you're a mother that's constantly running after her kids and, and um, sitting at practices and um, not really doing any type of movement for yourself, your muscle mass is shrinking. Um, as a physical therapist, one of the things we do is we test, you know, we do a lot of tests when people come into our clinic. We do like a sit to stand. Um, we do like a, um, a reach test. We do um, a stand up and go test. Uh, all that, what that's doing is giving us a, um, an evaluation start place for how deconditioned the person is. And you guys don't really have that ability to do that, but I'm trying to help you know that, you know, we need to move and I'm gonna show you more. Um, you just need to contact me. Um, but even a 25 year old, to not have a very good health movement record based on physical therapy evaluations because they sit at a desk for eight hours a day and then they go home and they sit in their car on the way home and then they get home and they have dinner and then after dinner they sit and watch tv to relax and that could be a 25 year old so um i'm just trying to encourage everybody to start maybe standing more stand-up desks are so awesome i'm standing at a stand-up desk right now okay and the last one is resistant exercise training. Um, muscle strengthening activities that make um, our muscles work. And one of the things that we need to realize is that um, when our muscle pulls on the bone, um, it helps our bone get stronger. And um, we need to do that so we prevent uh, bone osteoporosis. Um, moving our body against gravity is very important for our bones to stay strong. Um, let me see here. I'm just, just really quickly looking at my notes. I gotta do this fast. <laughs> okay. So, um, effects of, uh, resisted exercising on aging muscles are the same as for young muscles. Again, I don't care if you're 60 my age or you're 25. Um, we need to keep our muscles moving. So doing resisted exercises improves muscle strength. It increases muscle power. Power is both a product of strength and speed. Um, optimal power reflects how quickly you can exert force to produce the desired movement. Um, if you're starting, like let's say you're walking down a hill and you're, it's the hills full of gravel and you slip, how fast are you able to re react to stop yourself from falling? That's what we're talking about. Um, and resisted exercises help that. 
Um, and it improves muscle composition. I first started out with this conversation about muscle, about how um, our muscles decrease in size and fiber. Um, they shrink. That's a sarc um, osteosarcopenia. And what happens is we um, start to lose muscle mass. Like if you've ever hurt your foot or your ankle or your knee, you've noticed one of the muscles there, they start looking really small, like on your quads, I'm talking to the knee and it's, um, it's called um, atrophy. The muscle just shrinks. So, so some examples of resisted exercises are like doing push-ups or squatting or climbing or pulling and pushing and lifting and weight training. Those all help with bone health and strength and they help with um, muscle mass. They should be done at least three days of the week. And um, bone strengthening again is anytime you're moving your body against gravity. So good examples of strengthening the bones would be um, stair climbing, uh, dancing, skipping, jumping jacks, um, hiking, uh, push-ups, pull-ups, um, squats, anytime where you're moving your body against gravity. Okay. Now you may be asking, well, Sue, this seems like it's going to take an hour. So I do, and you're going to learn this next, well, in a week, I think, um, I do a hit exercise program every morning and it takes me about four to 15 minutes that I do and I'm making sure I, I take care of joint health right so I move my arms through the full range of motion and I also do um, muscle strengthening um, health of movement where either I'm um, stair climbing doing push-ups doing squats um, I do some pulling I do um so pushing, I do a lot of activities and it, it doesn't take that long. You guys, it doesn't need to take that long. Again, it's just like, you know, how do I get all my food in my system? People make this too hard. You, you know, you don't have to drive to the gym and do an hour and a half of running on the treadmill. You don't have to do that. And if you want for more information, like I do yoga and it's, let's start moving, you know, um, the big age group in there, you know, but if you've been sitting on the couch or sitting at practices watching your kids, you're not moving. So there's no difference between you and a 76 year old. You're not moving. So my yoga class is all about moving. It's not a bendy Barbie class. We do squats. We do lunges. We do all the yoga poses. And it's a great class. Tuesday, Thursday morning, 830. Okay, so now I want to talk about the fascial system. And the reason the fascial system is so important is because the fascial system connects like sometimes eight to 14 muscles in a long line. And the reason that's important is because that's why yoga is so cool is because I'm going to give you an example. Let's say I have a tight bicep, right? Okay. And I can't, I can't extend my elbow all the way. I think you can see that pretty good. And so my bicep is really tight. Well, that's just one muscle, right? So as a physical therapist, I work to straight stretch that out, but unfortunately, Fortunately, the fascial can actually, there's different lines. There's an anterior line, there's a lateral line, there's a spiral line. And the fascia is kind of like the gristle on meat. You see that kind of stringy stuff and it connects a line of muscles. And the reason why the fascial system is so important is I believe and a lot of studies have been um, proven and, and done that state that, that we hold some of our trauma in the fascia. Um, there's been studies where people are look like, like they look at a depressed postural um, person. Let's say their head's forward and their head's down. And there's a lot of tightness in this fascial line. Um, I'm starting a program called Yoga with Meridians. And what I'm doing is we're taking each one of the lines of the fascia that also coordinate with a meridian system. And that's with Chinese traditional medicine. And we, they found that the meridian system coordinates with the fascial system. And the Chinese tr traditional um, medicine knows and has studied and believes that different types of um, emotions can be held in these meridians. And so let's say the person's depressed and he's got tightness in the anterior fascial line. You know, some stretches to bring that out would be to bring the chest up, lift it to the ceiling, bring the arms back and do stretches to stretch this out. So that's kind of cool stuff that I'm working on too. But the fascial system, 
I am going to do a screenshot right now. I always hate doing this because I'm going to do and I'm going to mess it up. But here we go. I'm going to try and do this. And I'm going to share screen. Hold on, hold on. Here we go. So now I should be sharing this screen of the fascial system. So this is the anterior fascial line. And I just love the fascial system because with yoga, you're always stretching it out. You're going through different poses that stretch the whole line. So let's say, so this fascial system starts up here at the jaw and actually in the temporalis back here, there's a muscle, but this whole line comes down and it goes through the anterior cervical spine. Then here are the fascial, it takes into account the um, iliopsoas, the quadratum lumborum, and comes down into the adductor muscles, but it also has a little snippet here in your foot. And so when I have patients that come in and they say, hey, Sue, um, I have plantar fasciitis. Um, or they have tightness in their foot, that could be this whole line that they need to stretch out. Let's say you maybe have jaw pain. Well, that jaw pain can actually be caused because this line that has all these muscles in it down here at the foot, that's tight. Crazy, right? But it's true. So the fascia line is really important to stretch out. And the only, there's a lot of different exercises. I'm going to stop sharing now and come back to you guys. There's a lot of different exercises that you can do to stretch out the fascia, but some of the really important ones would be, um, and if you join my yoga, you'll get these every single time, but some of them are like heel sit where you sit back, you know, you're kind of on your hands and knees, you curl your toes under, and then you bring your buttock back onto your calves and you stretch that line. It stretches out the plantar fascia. Um, there's another one that we do all the time, which is called downward facing dog, which would stretch out the posterior line of the fascia. The other one that's really good for fascial stretching is the standing hip flexor stretch. And, and that one, you know, is where you take your leg and you bring it back, but you have to keep your pelvis tight. And I guess I can't step back long enough for you to see that. So check out one of my yoga classes or or email me at sue at suecillwellness.com and possibly just join one of my classes or say, hey, Sue, I want to just talk to, uh, to you on a Zoom meeting. Um, my yoga classes are all Zoom, which is awesome for me as a yoga therapist because you guys are little squares and I get to see every single body part in yoga class. I used to teach at a gym. I've taught there for five years. Everybody would hide behind everybody. It's like, I don't want the instructor to see me screwing up, so I'm just going to hide behind Sophia. But when I'm zooming in, I do it all virtually. I see everything and I love it because then I can say, hey, Sophia, I need you to turn your foot this way. Okay, so um, there is a standing figure four stretch going on further where you cross your, let's say it's your right ankle on top of your left knee and then squat down and have squat standing only on your left leg. That's another stretch that stretches out your buttock muscles. But again, it's too hard for me to try and explain that. So hopefully you'll want to participate in a yoga class. But the most important thing I wanted you to get out of this today was we have to move. Now movement can be, you got to move the joints, you got to move the muscles, and you got you to gotta move the fascia right now. We've learned that now. We're going to learn about cell health, telomeres, longevity, and cardio health next time. But so important is Movement doesn't have to be icky. So what do I do for movement? I ride my bike, I kayak, I paddleboard yoga, I do yoga, I walk every morning. I do my four to 15 minute um, hit exercise three times a week. Um, and then sometimes I can't do the 15 minutes because I'm in a hurry and I have meetings and I have clients coming. So I'll do a four minute session three times a day. Everybody can fit four minutes in. And we're going to go over that next week. Um, but movement, it could be dancing. You know, you turn on the music while you're cooking dinner and dance around. Um, it can be, um, gosh, playing tennis or golfing or hiking. Oh, hiking is such a great activity and it's beautiful. The, the, the scenery is beautiful. The environment is beautiful. I love hiking now. All of these things can be done and have fun, you can do them and have fun. It doesn't have to mean going to a gym. 
It doesn't have to mean that. What it means is you're going to have fun doing it. One of the things I also did is I thought, oh, okay, I like all this line dancing that everybody's doing, but you know, I was in college and I was doing all these things. So I wasn't around all the different line dancing. So sometimes I'll just put on my TV and I'll learn the line dance and I'm sitting here working out doing the line dance, or I'll get on some kind of YouTube video that's dancing and I'll dance because I like to dance. Whatever it is, just move at least 15 to 30 minutes a day. Just go for a walk. But we got to do muscle, joint, and fascial work. Okay, you guys. <laughs> I don't know if I talk too long. I don't know if it's past 15 minutes. Chat me. I'll ask. I'll answer all the questions that I can. And I'll see you next week to learn about longevity of the cell and cardio and cellular health. Okay. Bye-bye, you guys.